and welcome everybody today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here. Uh, we're talking about artificial intelligence. It's a hot topic. And uh, the idea of shining light in the language classroom is all about maybe rethinking what we're doing in uh, the language classroom in view of AI. We start off with this image, and many of you will recognize, if you're a Star Wars fan, 3CPO. 3CPO, uh, I put him on the, uh, on the first slide because he was proficient in more than 6 million languages. So I thought, okay, well, that's a good one. Okay, so let's begin. So what do you think of when you think of artificial intelligence? Everyone's going to have something different. But for me, uh, a big part of it is to think about uh, all of the science fiction I've seen in which robots quite often are using artificial intelligence. And for me, uh, as, a, as an older person, I, uh, I saw a lot of things for when I was a child uh, about uh, robots that sometimes go bad. Uh, that was a big thing. The Jetsons was a big influence on me. Uh, in this role, they were inconspicuous tools. Uh, so they went from servants to inconspicuous tools. In 2001, A Space Odyssey, they were intelligent, but not moral. Ah, what does this mean? Well, uh, actually, Chomsky, Roberts, and Watam will talk about this idea of true intelligence is also capable of moral thinking. This means constraining the otherwise limitless creativity of our minds with some ethical principles. So it's not enough just to be a genius. You have to be a genius who thinks about others, as empathizes. Star Wars, 1977, bumbling but loyal friends. Uh, the Terminator, scary stuff. Enemies of humans. This becomes a, a constant trend in science fiction. In fact, even, even uh, Stephen Hawking talked about this. He said that full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So he talked about that in 2014. Um, what is he talking about? Well, many people refer to what we say is the paperclip problem. And imagine this, you program some AI, it's running a factory, and all of a sudden its only job is to make more paper clips. The person goes away from the desk for a while, they're locked out of the factory, but it keeps working, it keeps doing its job, and actually it uses up all of the resources on Earth, it digs up every metal to make paper clips, and then it starts looking at people and say, 2.5% of every body is metal. So they say, oh, there's some more metal. I'll make more paper clips. What does this come from? It comes from the idea that artificial intelligence is often driven by an objective, but it's not thinking about it ethically or morally. Ex Machina 2014, moving a little bit more forward. Uh, slaves deserving of sympathy. So we start to identify with the uh, intelligence of the of the of the uh, robots. Um, the creator, 2023, very recent, last year, all of a sudden these robots are freedom fighters. They're, they're fighting against oppression and trying to survive like a separate species. Okay, so all of this background, all of this background is partly leading us to the ideas that artificial intelligence is on the rise. And most of you will recognize this uh, white uh, symbol on the green background as being, to, uh, as being chat GPT, which uh, has, has led the revolution in allowing us to search for information in different ways. Um, so one of our questions is, you know, how can this impact language teaching and learning? And that's what we're going to be exploring here today. I'm going to go fairly quickly. Again, a video, as Thomas said, a video will be available. So if you want to go back and look at anything or if you want to pause it, if you want to share it with some friends, uh, maybe around the teaching staff room, that's great. Uh, you, you, you can share these ideas and take a little more time to reflect on them. Okay, how does AI work? Uh, so, the first question. First of all, there's many different AI programs, not just ChatGPT, but all of the ones you see on the right-hand side of the screen are all different ones that do slightly different jobs. Uh, in general, we call it a large language model, and it allows it to generate text by looking at huge amounts. And you may have seen lawsuits from people like the New York Times saying, hey, you stole all our you know, old newspapers uh, to train your AI. You know, that's not fair. So there's a few questions about that. But the big question for us is, 
is artificial intelligence intelligent, right? Well, uh, sorry, that's the name, isn't it? Well, actually, nope. It is not intelligent. A tool like ChatGPT has no understanding. It has no knowledge. It merely collates or puts together uh, bits of words together based on statistical probability. So if I say something like better late than never, right? The never is the word that most often comes up, right? Um, I, but I could say something else, right? In, in a conversation, I said better late than not at all, or better late than cheap, or better late than something else. Uh, but it will look for the most likely sort of things based on reviewing hundreds of millions of examples uh, that are available through the web. Okay, so it seems intelligence, it seems intelligent, it collects, it sorts, it organizes ideas faster and in some way, very unexpected ways. So it does a great job of that. What about AI in the language classroom? So how does that work? Well, the, the title of this, I talk about this idea of shining a light uh, on the language classroom. And what I mean by this is every time we introduce a new technology to the language classroom, it makes us rethink our jobs as teachers. It makes us rethink our uh, the student roles as well. So uh, I use the example of the blackboard uh, invented in 1801. They used to have little slates. Every child would write on a piece of slate with chalk. But then, uh, then this uh, James Pillen said, hmm, what if I just put a big one up behind us and uh, put it on the wall? And that changed the nature of teaching and learning. Why? Because students could go up right there and display their work to the rest of the class. So it shone a light in a new way that education could take place. Is AI doing this? Well... AI innovations raise questions about how languages are taught and how they are learned, and we have to consider these questions. But teachers are uncertain about the innovations. You know, is it threatening the status quo? Is my job as a teacher going up in smoke? Uh, we see many people, uh, you know, in danger of losing their jobs to AI, such as in the film industry. It's it's huge because it can do so many things uh, in creating things that people used to do. But we're also optimistic. We're also optimistic about innovations that make our lives easier and make our lives a little more productive. So, but can we, oh, but it's too much, too much. Can we turn back the clock? Can we start over? Can we forget about this AI? Well, you know, it's, there are points to having a skeptical attitude towards AI, and we do need to examine it. Uh, we need to look at, at everything very closely. But uh, and even some some school districts have banned AI. So in New York and Los Angeles, two big cities in the United States, they banned it temporarily. <laughs> it didn't last very long. No, both cities quickly reversed their positions. So uh, so I think AI is here to stay. So should we fear AI? Should we be afraid of AI in some ways? Well, there's some different concerns that we do have as teachers. One is about our job security, uh, new digital divides, ignorance, plagiarism, and bias. Let's talk about each of those one at a time. Okay, so first of all, will AI take teachers' jobs? Well, I look back at Thomas Edison 101 years ago in, in 1823 or 1923, what did he say? He predicted that motion pictures would replace teachers and books, right? Did they? No, they didn't. Uh, he probably said that because, of course, he wanted to sell more motion picture equipment. Uh, since 1923, we hear these predictions over and over again, right? They say, oh, radio will replace schools, right? TV will replace schools, computers. Why should students go to schools? They can just use the computer. And now we're saying the same for AI. I don't buy it. I don't buy it for a minute. Um, AI benefits, uh, if they do come, uh, they're, they tend to go to the few. Uh, we see this uh, picture of this robot. This is at an Amazon warehouse. It's replacing, it's replacing uh, workers there. Oh, great. Well, I guess they're going to pay the workers more then, or they'll give all the profits to workers. No, they won't. No. Uh, and this is a fear of uncontrolled capitalism that teachers or anybody will be replaced 
and the benefits will not go to the teachers. They'll just go to somebody else. Okay, what about our next job? What about the next job? One curious thing now with artificial intelligence is when you send a CV in for a job, it's probably not a human being looking at it. This is so widespread. It's so common. Uh, so uh, they search through uh, AI programs, will look for keywords, will try to sort through, and it saves the companies huge amounts of time. But if you're applying for a teaching job somewhere else, are you getting a fair, you know, a fair review? Well, you may even be using AI to write your application, so it gets to be very, very complicated. But it does raise ethical questions, and some some states have started to uh, erase this altogether. Okay, the other big issue for me is digital divides. I talked a lot about this when I was younger, and uh, my kids were younger, and they went to a school that we didn't have a computer lab. We moved to a small island near Vancouver, Canada, and they didn't have a computer lab. I said, why not? And they were in a wealthy school district, and in, in the mainland, they had them, but not ours. And so, of course, I agitated, wrote some letters, and we got a computer lab. That was great. But uh, there's always educational inequities. Uh, there's always ch places where some students in the past didn't have computers, didn't have good Wi-Fi. They, uh, they, and now, you know, what about G chat GPT? That's going to be a divide as well, because for the more expensive paid subscription models, who's going to pay for that, right? Free versions, there are free versions available, um, but unlimited use and uh, improved use is usually 20 bucks a month per student, right? Who pays for that? Who pays for that? Teachers paying for that? Are schools going to pay for that? Are students going to pay for that? Well, in wealthier families, they will. In families that are not so wealthy, they will not. So... Um, another big issue is, does, uh, does AI lead students into ignorance? And Chomsky warns how artificial intelligence encourages students to embrace ignorance. What does he mean? What does he mean? I remember when calculators first came out, first came out and I was uh, teaching math uh, uh, when I was a, a young teacher in, in secondary school. And I remember the student asking the student, I said, okay, what's, what's, uh, what's three times six, right? And they said, they go, da, 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 180. And I said, no, no, it's not. And they go, 18,000. <laughs> and I said, no, it's 18. You're doing it wrong. Let's look at this again. Okay, so basically they believe the machine. That's the ignorance, is if we look something up and we believe the machine and uh, believe the data that's coming out of Google search or anything else, it can be problematical. We're not really using our thinking, critical thinking skills. Um, there's one, uh, this, uh, this one explanation of it. It's like AI is like a library without librarians. It's content which is disembodied and de decontextualized severed from meaningful work of authors, submitted to gullible readers. It's pretty damning, right? Uh, these systems are good at form, but bad at content. So they look like good information, but the content can be very poor. So for example, someone uh, recently asked the new Gemini AI from Google, could you produce some uh, pictures of soldiers from uh, 1943, 1943 Germany, right? What are we talking about? Nazis. What did it produce? Black and Chinese soldiers, women. So, and no, it was completely in a, in a, you know incorrect historically. But the the AI didn't know that it was trying to be multicultural and include you know faces from different people. But it really didn't do the job. So we have to use critical thinking. We have to use critical thinking. The fourth issue is it's, is it a path to plagiarism? And this is a major one for teachers. You know, we're asked students to write essays. They say, oh, no problem. ChatGPT, you know, write an essay on any topic. It's perfect, right? Well, often it's not. So O'Brien notes teachers often have intuitive suspicions. They look at it and they say, ah, I don't know. And, and this one used the example of Labrithian mazes, right? And that's not something a 14-year-old would say. It was wrong. So, but in many cases, AI plagiarism can be difficult to spot. So, so fortunately, we have tools. So Sharma lists 15 tools. And if you go online, you'll find 50 easily. 
or uh, for identifying the use of AI in students' writing. So uh, even even ChatGPT <laughs> created their own uh, called Text Classifier to figure this out as well. It's it's ironic, right? They they create the problem and then they're trying to create the solution as well at the same time, making money off both sides, of course, right? Winston, uh, this Winston can check things like the human score, uh, plagiarism, and readability. Uh, so it can it can look at things even it can look at images. Uh, so if somebody has searched something and put an image into their uh, presentation, uh, and you say eh, is that really accurate or something? And no, it's not. It's just created. So you can do that. Unfortunately, there's also a race to create uh, to create programs that trick the AI checkers. So it's like a war. It's like two soldiers on both sides, and they just constantly escalate, escalating with more and more weapons, you know, one to improve the AI, one to improve the checking of it as well. So it's it's a problem. The fifth issue is bias, bias in AI. Um, this has long been uh, long been an issue in any kind of artificial intelligence gathering from the from from even a couple of decades ago when police used databases to examine, you know, where the most criminal areas were in a city. So where do the most crimes take place? And, you know, we can put extra police officers there. Well, often it was because they were in cities and the police were being racist and they were going into the poorer neighborhoods because it was easier to catch criminals. They were ignoring the wealthier areas. So it starts to feed on itself. It starts to feed on itself. And the biases uh, emerge. They can be not just racial biases, but gender biases, right? Because again, it's looking at, you know, are most doctors male? Um, I don't know. Are they? Are they? Uh, uh, but it might because it looks historically and historically most doctors were male. Uh, so then it starts to say, show a picture of a doctor and it's male, you know, because it's making uh, what it thinks is a logical assumption, even though an increasing number of doctors are female. Right. So it's, it's just kind of a crazy thing. OK, so the, the rule that we have is garbage in, garbage out. So if you feed them garbage, uh, then it will produce garbage. And this happened in 2016 with one of the early forms of artificial intelligence. It was a, a Microsoft uh, chatbot called Tay. And, uh, and essentially, it asked the public to teach it, to ask questions and answer questions, and it would teach it, right? But uh, people went on as a kind of a sick game, and they, t they taught it racist things, misogynistic content, and they had to shut it down after just like two days or something because it was getting so bad. All right. What about uh, other biases? Okay. So a lot of it is uh, because a lot of things that have been published, and particularly published in English, it gives a Western perspective on things. Uh, you know, it's uh, the AI systems are not going to look at uh, Chinese and Arabic and, you know, uh, other language groups, even French, and try to figure out, you know, like, what's their perspectives on issues? It's mostly looking at English. If it's an American company, for example, or a Canadian company, so the knowledge, the experiences, and the underrepresented communities are just are just ignored. And so that becomes a big problem. Uh, what about L2 speakers? This is our passion, right? I mean, our whole lives as teachers are spent with second language speakers of English. Um, tests on seven popular AI text detectors found that articles written by people who did not speak English as a first language were often wrongly flagged by AI-generated uh, programs as being as being plagiarized or or used by a machine. They weren't. They were just written by people whose English wasn't perfect. And so this is an enormous uh, problem, not just in you know with students, but actually for people applying for jobs as well. Okay, okay. Oh, so much bad news. I'm crying now, right? Okay, well, don't worry. What can we hope for? What can we hope for with AI? What's some positive news? Let's look at that. Okay, so there's five things we can hope for. Embracing change, identifying new objectives, uh, celebrating the human touch, uh, fostering independence, um, and challenging the status quo in some different ways. So let's look at, again, let's look at each of these in turn. Okay, the first one, embracing change. Okay, so Ross says, you have to stop thinking. You can teach exactly the way you used to teach 
when the basic medium has changed, he explains. If students can turn to ChatGPT and other AI language models for a quick and easy answers, then there's a problem with the lesson, right? So we can't, we can't expect just to keep teaching the way we have always taught if a student just takes out their phone and says, no, no teacher, that's wrong. I don't think that's right. You know, I, I've got something else here. So all of a sudden, we need to readjust and rethink how we do teach and maybe take advantage of some of the opportunities that AI provides. And toward the end of this, I'm going to give specific tips, specific tips on seven tips on what you can do in your classroom starting tomorrow. So, uh, so let's keep going through this. As part of this embracing change, we can try to tailor learning. So some this is uh, from St. George and Sprugla. Uh, it says, um, some faculty members use artificial intelligence to reach multiple types of learners by asking for three different examples of a concept to find one that might click. So again, as teachers, we do this, we do this. If a student doesn't understand something, we try to think of another example. Uh, but uh, AI can help us with this and maybe think of those in when we're doing our lesson planning. Say, think of you know, the passive voice. How can you explain it? Explain it again, explain it a third way. And then when I'm teaching a class, if the students don't get it, maybe I can go back to those explanations and share them, right? So that's a great thing. So think about AI as your assistant, okay? I've got my assistant here working for me, helping me out with my uh, some of my job. Uh, the second thing is to identify new goals. So our education system should recognize the unique aspects of human intelligence. Um, at school, this would mean focusing on teaching high-level thinking capabilities and designing a system to supercharge our intelligence. Literacy and numeracy remain fundamental. Of course, we're still going to, you know, teach reading and writing and speaking and listening. We're still going to teach, you know, counting and numbers. But now we must add artificial intelligence literacy. So we have to start teaching students, how do you do an AI search? How do you know when you do an AI search that something's not quite right? What are some tricks and tips that you can use to get better, uh, better output in that? Um, we have to celebrate the human touch, human touch as well. We are human, and that's something a machine will never replace. I think about uh, many, uh, many of these third-party apps. Um, there was a study done on Duolingo, said that you know what's the average time that people use Duolingo? Three weeks. Three weeks. And they start. They have big ambitions, and then three weeks later, they don't. Not everybody. Many people use it for years. It's great, fantastic, good for them. But they, uh, it's that human relationship that's often missing in that. And we have that in a classroom. And we have it not just with the teachers and the students, but students and students, uh, peers. Okay, so uh, I, I love this quote. I've been a former students. I've been to former students' weddings and baby showers and funerals of their parents says Millard. Uh, she's a high school teacher in Michigan. I've hugged my students. I've high-fived my students. I've cried with my students. A computer will never do that, ever, ever. And I think that's true for AI as well. So again, celebrate what we can do as humans to really have a comp conversation, to really have empathy, to care, not just in answering a question once, but long term. So you keep thinking about things. I use this uh, metaphor about a lot of our teaching is, uh, is like throwing a pebble into a pond. You see the splash? You see the splash? But it's the ripples that sometimes matter, like years later, maybe months later. But as a teacher, you follow up and you sort of check. Say, how are you doing now? It's, I remember you were having a problem with this. Yeah. Foster independence, the fourth point. The less students need educators to be the main source of knowledge, the more educators can focus on de uh, developing the ability to curate, guide, critically assess uh, learning, and to help students gain skills. So again, if, if most of what you're teaching is just simple memorization and AI can help you with that in some ways, uh, you know, getting the students some special way to sort of figure out where their shortcomings are, and you can address some of the more important issues then, you know, again, using AI to do that. So the independence is pushing responsibility onto the students. It's your job to learn. I'm teaching, that's my job, but you have a job here too. You have to learn. And how are you going to do that? Push responsibility to the students. 
Um, in Los Angeles schools, they uh, I find this a little creepy. They've created this chat bot or something. It it reminds students to create assi assignments. It also assists their parents to access the grades and attendance uh, of records. And it also, it's a voice that speaks to the students early in the morning, late in the evening. It wakes you up, nudges you, reminds you of your attendance, homework. <laughs> wow, this is really something, you know, getting uh, getting a, a, an app sort of really involved in their education, not just in the content, but in the management of what the student is doing and, and making sure that they're doing their work. Crazy. Okay. Challenging the status quo. Okay, so here's six questions that you're going to ask yourself. Is AI improving the qualitator of an educator's day-to-day -day work? Are teachers experiencing less burden and more ability to focus on your uh, on teaching your students? So is, is it making your job better? Like, is it really improving things? The second one is, is AI reduces one type of teaching burden? Are new responsibilities or additional workloads being shifted and assigned? So again, this is always the case is when, uh, you know, uh, administrators, school administrators dream of this. They say, oh, yes, if we have computers, then the teachers don't have to. Uh, we can get the teachers doing other work or we can have larger classes or something like that. So you have to make sure that the teachers have more time to do their jobs if AI takes over some of their jobs. Is classroom AI use providing teachers with more detailed insights into their students, their strengths, uh, but while protecting their privacy? This privacy issue is huge because a lot of programs like, uh, like you know, ChatGPT collects the information in the questions that you're asking. So it's a little bit of your privacy going out the door every time you ask a question on Google or, or an AI platform or anything. Do teachers have oversight of AI systems used with their learners? Well, I can answer that question. That's going to be no. You often don't. You often don't uh, have, ac you know, you, you can't control it. You're not on the board of directors of the company. Um, but maybe you could say, okay, use this program. Don't use this program, right? Uh, are there protections against surveillance ac accurate? So I've got a little picture of a vacuum cleaner here. It's uh, um, it's like it does, again, as it sucks up a lot of information. Can teachers improve equity, uh, reduce bias, and increase create cultural responsiveness in the use of AI-enabled tools, tools and systems? So I have a, I have a, um, uh, a niece, uh, and she works uh, with First Nations, um, we used to call them, uh, or Aboriginals or Indians in Canada. And she, she goes and she works with them. And I know the materials, she talks about this, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing for their specific, you know, background, their history, their knowledge, their interests. And so, you know, could she use AI to create some things on this? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, but we have to be able to examine the bias involved with that. Okay, what practical AI uh, ideas can teachers use today? So, you know, what are some things you can actually use AI for to improve your classroom? This is a very practical part of it. Let's have a look at here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about seven ideas. Um, the first one is to flip the paradigm, flip the paradigm. Uh, what do we mean by that? Is uh, a paradigm is how we normally do things. Maybe we change it. Uh, create individual tutors for students. Localize uh, our teaching materials. Uh, assess in new ways. Uh, plan lessons. Um, personalize content for students and to teach genres in new ways. So let's get started. Let's look at some of these very practical things and see which ones you can use. Okay, let's begin. Uh, I'm just going to start. I use a couple of examples from a uh, Pearson textbook. Uh, oh, I was the series consultant on this uh, um, a couple of years ago, so uh, so I kind of know the series, but it doesn't matter. Any textbook that you use, it's going to be quite similar. A lot of the resources are going to be there. So, um, but I'll just use a couple of examples from this. Okay, flip the paradigm. Flip the paradigm. This is our first one. What exactly do we mean by that? Okay, so the first one is to ask students to reflect on uh, their use of artificial intelligence. So, okay, we're saying, okay, you can use it, you can use it, but I need you to talk about how you're using it. So his policy now requires students to write a reflective passage 
alongside each assignment about the writing process, asking them to document what sources uh, they use. They can use AI, but they must provide a full dialogue. So, you know, when you do a search on AI, you know, what is the da 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 and you have to put that in, plus the answer. Maybe you refine your question, you go again, you go again, you go again. You put all of that, copy all of that, paste it, and you give that to the teacher as well. It is part of your assignment is to share um, share the resources and, and things that you're using in this way. So it, it, it's basically getting them involved in that. I, I, I did this. I thought this. Um, so uh, I teach graduate students and doctoral students. Um, they're all teachers uh, around the world, actually. I teach online. And uh, one of the courses I teach is discourse analysis. So looking at, you know, what people say and why they say it, why do they write things in certain ways and not others, and it examines that. So with my own doctoral and master's students, I flip the paradigm and I ask them to annotate their use of AI uh, in their research, in their papers, in their discussion forum contributions. I said, just go crazy. Use it as much as you can, much as you can. Uh, for you know, Use it as your first stop, not the library, but the first stop. Just go there first and look at it. I just didn't know what to expect. I just really, really wanted them to try it. And, uh, but also I, you know, following this advice, I wanted them to reflect on this. So, um, uh, but one of the most dangerous things about chat GPT is that it sounds so authoritative. Uh, uh, the bot can answer every question, but not always correctly. In his research, he has found many people who seem to accept the answers given. Now, this is so common. You just get the answer, and it's the same as my student, you know, my grade, you know, grade nine student using the calculator and coming up with three times six is 180. You know, he's it, it, just thinking that the machine must be right when it's obviously not. There's something very particular here, and Fisher identifies this. It's a trend called hallucinations. Hallucinations. And it means that AI, the artificial intelligence, is making up. It's making up the answers. So as my students wrote papers, I found ChatGPT generating some false references. How did I know this? How did I know this? <laughs> well, they came up, one of my students came up with this reference for Beattie, you know, Professor Ken Beattie. And uh, it was uh, the use of AI in uh, teaching and uh, teaching and learning English as a second language, right? Fantastic, right? Published by System, you know, the leading journal in the field. Uh, it gave the month and the date and the pages and everything else. There was just one problem, just one problem. It didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I never wrote that. Oh, I never wrote that at all. And it, it's terrifying. It's terrifying because, of course, the student got it and, you know, it even had quotes from it. But I didn't write that, right? I've written a lot about computer-assisted language learning. Um, I have textbook in the area that it probably stole some ideas from. But really, that was not me. So it created these things. So it looks authoritative. And we've seen other examples of this with uh, lawyers in the United States. Have uh, There's two cases, uh, big cases, where they, they looked up the legal cases for something and they just put it into their brief to the judge. But when the, uh, there was one with an airline and they were suing the airline, the airline stood up in court and said, uh, we want all charges dismissed because the lawyer or the or the defense has uh, has or the prosecution has faked the uh, brief to the to the court and and the judge was angry he he cited the lawyer and I mean it was really really a big serious thing but again they were hallucinations it looked perfect but it was because of the questions that they were asking. Now, this gets more complicated. This gets a lot more complicated because um, one thing that I do is I review for a couple of uh, journals like Computer Assisted Language Learning. I don't check every single reference. I don't go back in to make sure that every single reference is there. So what if I miss one like this? Now it becomes an issue with me. I'm concerned. What if, what if some that's published and then somebody else takes this one and then publishes it again? And you can see how these fake articles will start to grow. So it's terrifying. 
So the worry is that if AI delivers false answers confidently with the ring of truth, they may be accepted by people, a development that would only deepen the age of misinformation that we live in. So it will continue to breed misinformation as more and more questions are asked and answered and then quoted and then cited, right? Uh, what's a practical example? Uh, okay, so make a home video. Students can use AI for help with scripts with their homework videos. So this is, again, just from the textbook that I mentioned earlier, Startup. And it's, 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 it's a task in every, every, um, every unit of the first four books of the series. Create a little media project, either pictures or, or video. Well, what they could do is they could make a script. So ask AI to help them to write a script about it. It's per still personal, and that's what I love about this, because it's a personal assignment. It's not a big, just a research task of some kind, like, you know, uh, write, write something about, you know, the beginnings of World War II. That's too general, right? Get something quite personal. So the student can use that. And then they can also reflect on when AI gives them poor advice. Second idea is to create individual tutors for students. Why personal tutors? When students spend frequent one-on-one -on -one instruction time with a tutor, their learning improves. We know that. We know that. Tutors help clarify complex topics. Uh, they elicit reflection. They ask students to think more about something. And they motivate students to take ownership uh, of their learning. So those are all positive things about human tutors. Can AI do that as well? Well, I think it's possible. I think it's possible that you could... By asking the right questions, you could get AI to start being a tutor. Some, uh, some groups have already tried doing this independently, and the Khan Academy is one of them. Uh, they created so something called Conmigo, so it sounds like amigo, Spanish word for friend, and, uh, but it, it's limited. It's limited to predefined set of questions, so it's not very flexible. It's, it's not open-ended, and that's basically to control control the types of questions that are asked and, and, and the feedback that it will give. Um, what about a public option? Uh, uh, there's Schneider and Sanders, Sanders suggest a public AI is necessary um, to balance the AI provided by corporations and motivated by profit. So again, we've got, uh, this is, I think, a very, very good idea is that we need a public option. We need governments to sort of create an AI that, uh, that is free for everyone to use, like uh, Wikipedia or something, uh, but, you know, isn't tainted or, you know, has price points for, for using it in some way. Um, I, I just included these Facebook avatars designed for Pakistan. Again, it's a kind of a personalization thing. Okay, practical. Teach tutor prompts. So if you want to have a tutor, the AI may not have up-to-date information about a specific topic. Um, there's a risk of errors and fabrications with any model. So there's a possibility of students learning the wrong thing. The AI's output is hard to assess for students who are new to a topic. So again, you have to keep an eye on them. You have to keep an eye on them. If you're going to have an AI tutor, you have to be involved as well. So that's part of your role in shaping this. Maybe they'll get better. Who knows? We'll see. Number three, localize. Uh, why are learning materials not local? Okay, so I write a lot of textbooks, um, and uh, and and I write them used internationally. Sometimes they're very specific to a country. I've written. I lived in uh, Asia, uh, Hong Kong, and and China for uh, seventeen years. So uh, so basically, so basically, I have a lot of experience in that area and wrote books, say for just for China, but. Quite often, most books are international, and it's just economics. They have to sell to a wider market to make them work. And so for that reason, they're not really local. Um, old school versus new school. You can create learning materials based on local culture, food, sports, history, geography. I'm not suggesting you replace textbooks. Um, textbooks do a number of things that AI does not, including ordering a scope and sequence. So... You know, you've got the order of what should be taught, you know, when it should be taught, when it should be retaught, and, you know, it, it's organized to the level. But if you want to make some uh, materials that complement the books and, you know, deal with your local context the way no t textbook will, then you can do that. And always better yet, uh, and you've heard me talk before, you probably know I always sneak in the phrase, be a lazy teacher. If you are doing something that the students could do, Get them to do it instead. 
it's better, right? They'll learn a lot by doing uh, the things like uh, that you are doing. Uh, they'll learn leadership, creativity, critical thinking, everything. So get your students to create the materials instead. Okay, students can prompt uh, ChatGPT. Uh, list five local foods in whatever your country is uh, with definitions. So again, they start getting a little more current information. Now, many textbooks, they talk about international ideas and issues. Many things will be based in, you know, Britain or the U.S. or Canada or something. But, uh, you know, they nobody nobody ever goes and says, oh, oh, you know, you're from you're from uh, Peru. Uh, what can you tell me about the Empire State Building? <laughs> no. What can you tell me about the Statue of Liberty? Nobody says that. It's in useful information and great that they teach it. But what they will say is, oh, what are your local foods? You know, what what's what's your culture? You know, what do you what do you do in your country for fun? Right. Those are the questions we really ask international speakers. So they should be able to talk about those things. And so ChatGPT can help or a, any AI program. Uh, here's here's one from uh, a student, uh, a teacher working with uh, grade six students. She said this spring, many of her sixth graders used AI to help write letters to public officials. Uh, so she, she got her students involved in complaining about pollution or sidewalks or crossroads or, you know, whatever was whatever was a local issue. And she asked them to to do that. Uh, Alvik used ChatGPT to rewrite the readings about current events at different levels so that her students could understand. So this was a great one. So she would take a complicated article, maybe about pollution in a city, water pollution or something, ask ChatGPT to rewrite it for the grade six level, and then they could read it, and then they could write a letter, again, using ChatGPT, and uh, get involved. I thought that was great. Great. Okay. So they could grasp various topics, including Pride Month. I was just, uh, this is one of my photos in, I was just, uh, last year I was in uh, Cusco in Peru, and I saw this rainbow, and I took a picture. I didn't notice the pride flag, which is also a rainbow, you know, at the same time. So just a lucky thing. Ask AI to simplify content. So very, very simple command. Simplify, you put in your content for a CEFR A2 language learner. So if we do that, you know, we can ask it to do that, and it's going to draw on what it knows about CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference, uh, the A2 level. It'll figure that out. Or will it? Or will it? <laughs> this is our question here. Is this really CFR A2? Okay, so this is what I asked it to write in, uh, you know, ceviche. Uh, ceviche is a famous dish in Lima. It's made with raw fish or seafood soaked in lime or lemon juice. People add onions, chili peppers, and spices for flavor. It's served with sweet potatoes, corn, and lettuce. I love it. I love it. It's one of the things I look forward to when I travel to uh, Peru and many other countries uh, in Latin America. Anyway, but is it CEFRA2? Uh, you have to check. You have to check. So I ran the paragraph through uh, through Vocab Kitchen, which is a, a, a CEFR checker. It's free. You can get it online. And uh, actually, seafood, lime, chili, and flavor are not anywhere, nowhere on the CEFR list. doesn't mean you can't use them, but it does mean that you have to explain it separately to your students. Then when I did look at the paragraph, it said uh, other words. Uh, were too high a level. They weren't A2. They were raw spices, corn, and lettuce, the ones in orange. They were all B1. And soaked is a B2 word. It's too high level. So can I rewrite this and make it a little bit better? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, probably I can. Or I can say, these words are important. Maybe I should teach these to my students separately before they read this uh, content. But again, don't trust AI. Don't trust. Always, always do your own check on that, right? How about some practical things? We'll start with goals. Think about each textbook goal and then add a local city or place to the AI search. So again, for this particular one, learning goals, uh, talk about food, order in a restaurant, ask for restaurant items. Again, for talk about food, just add your country and that gives some extra things that the students can be learning. Number four, assess in some new ways. 
asked ChatGPT uh, for it to make a test on Peruvian food, right? It's fantastic, right? So I, I asked it to make one multiple choice, one true, false, one critical thinking question. Um, it says, why do you think Aji de uh, Galina is described as a creamy chicken dish? What ingredients might contribute to its creamy texture? And how does this dish showcase the diversity of Peruvian cuisine? Okay, it's it's kind of a complicated question for a higher level, but I could work on that if I wanted to bring it down to a lower A2 level. So you maybe have to do that, but it will write. It will write some of these questions for you. Uh, tailored assessment. Give AI your test results as well. Uh, so this is some things that people do. They take all their answers from their students, they put it back into AI, and they ask AI to grade it. So for that critical thinking question in particular, uh, I could ask it to track and see. AI models can track the progress and generate tailored methods and teach and reinforce each student, allowing teachers to have more detailed and in-depth understanding of individual students' needs. So if I got a student answer, I might say, how could this be improved? Or what are the problems with this one? And they might say, well, you know, they're using the passive voice or, you know, the, uh, they're using the comparatives or superlatives inappropriately or something like that. Uh, and they'll go through and then remember that and maybe teach, uh, continue teaching the student. Okay, let students create tests. This is a great idea. I encourage students to write their own tests on the target language and content. Thinking about creating a test is a review activity for students. And this is, this is my favorite thing, subversive teaching. The students think they're doing one thing. I'm writing a test. But you know they're really reviewing the content, right? You don't have to tell. <laughs> but by creating a test, they're really reviewing the unit in a much more a comprehensive way. And so they can use these practice tests to prepare. I guarantee their performance will go up if they're doing this. Number five, plan lessons. Okay, this is for you as a teacher. Uh, this was an interesting one uh, where um, someone uh, had to do something for a drama class. He needed a 16-week outline, but he also needed it for his state standards. So it read his state standards, and then it created it. took two or three minutes to do this. Then he asked for it to create daily de lesson plans tied to the state and school district standards for 90 minutes classes every other day. In minutes, they appeared. So it's magic. It's magic, really, you know, what it's doing. So it's giving, a, you know, it, it, creating lesson plans. But, 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 but don't reinvent the wheel. Like, so this is what kind of surprises me with a lot of the things. People are trying to use AI to do things that have already been done. So again, you know, for the textbook that I mentioned, the startup books, they have teacher's books. The teacher's books have extensive materials. They tell you step by step what to do. They have all the answers. They have, you know, extra additional things like language notes and, and options for, you know, more able and less able students. They've got culture notes and also exit tickets, uh, which, mean, or, uh, which means how do you know the students, you know, have understood everything and comprehended and can use the language and extension activities. You want some homework for them? It's all there. Like, why would you reinvent this? Or why would you spend hours on chat GPT trying to create this when it's already in your textbook? So start with your textbooks first. Something practical is extra lessons. They can create additional lesson plans for presenting content in different ways, though. Or extending a topic. So again, if you have one or two students, you know, uh, having problems with a particular topic, maybe you can maybe you can do this. But again, shift the responsibility to students. Ask them to get involved doing that. Personalize number six. Create flashcards. So this is an example of somebody who was trying to learn Chinese and improve, and she used two plugins um, called Link Reader and and Meta Ment Met, uh, Meta Mentor. Ah, uh, my problem again is who pays for this because you have to pay for both those plugins. But she created flash cards for herself and she also wanted to learn how to drive the motorcycle. So again, she went to her state's motorcycle licensing manual to create test questions and she passed. So it obviously worked. Um, help with uh, something practical is to help with particular needs. So again, this is a unit about employment, uh, the workplace. 
But, you know, every student that you have, if you have older students, they, they're going to be interested in a very particular job. What about my job? You know, what can I do for my job? And so what, what you can do is ask Cheap, ChatGPT to adjust some of the content. Is it employment questions you want, like interview questions for a job? Interview questions for an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse or, you know, whatever occupation interests that, that person. And so you can produce those. And that could be quite useful for them. Okay, number seven. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Okay, so we want to teach genres. Teach genres. What are genres? Genres are, are, are like typical ways that we, you know, typical ways that we uh, have things like newspapers or magazines or science fiction stories or westerns or romance novels. Everything is a genre, informational text. Uh, and so we can use, we can use ChatGPT to focus on very particular genres that we're trying to teach students. So one is uh, poetry, poetry. So maybe you're teaching poetry. I always encourage teachers to use more literature in their classrooms. Uh, so one such project involves asking uh, the chatbot to compose poetry in a specific style, after which the students analyze the generated content. So it creates the poem and you say, oh, yes, I want you to present in a, you know, in a 16th century sonnet form. You know, you could do that. And uh, then the students, uh, you know, examine it. Has it done a good job of that? Why or why not? And so, again, it's this reflection, the critical thinking that's going on here. Uh, critique, AI writing. It's Sarah Millard, uh, a ninth grade uh, English teacher. She had a great idea. She asked ChatGPT to write an essay about um, Romeo and Juliet. And then she said to the students, tear it apart, tear it apart, you know, have a look. What does it do well? What does it do badly? She said the students loved it. They went crazy over trying to beat the computer, they called it, uh, trying to figure out what it had done well and what it could do better. So these were important issues for it. So again, it's a great approach for using uh, using AI in a different way. But wait, wait, isn't Shakespeare too hard for L2 students? Well, well, it is. Um, as a lot of it is quite complicated. So we say, Romeo, Romeo, why must you bear that name? Renounce, it's not on the CEFR. Your father, let love be our only claim. B2, uh, uh, hesitate and cast are all B2 words. A couple of B1 words, promise and stone are, uh, are B1 words. Maybe that's a little one. So I say, rewrite, that's my chat GPT prompt, rewrite it as a poem in modern, simple English. So I haven't put in the A2 or anything else here, just a very simple one. What does it come up with? Oh, Romeo, Romeo, why do you carry that name? Forget your family. Love will be our flame. If you won't, just promise you'll be mine, and I'll leave behind the name Capulet in time. I love this. I love this. Okay, so they did use two words, but fewer, fewer than the original. They've got flame and promise, a B2 and a B1 word. That's okay. I could teach those. And they're both important words, I think, that for students to know. And But I love the fact that it's produced this and it rhymes. It still works as a little poem. So again, it's very, very clever. And it does, uh, it does. It's not intelligent, but it is clever in, you know, figuring up from the large language model to bring it down into something that's useful. Practical, build on textbook genres. So both teachers and students can generate AI extra genre examples. As I mentioned earlier, AI is good at form, even if it's bad at content. So remain vigilant about the AI. So if you're if you if you're doing something, here's a flow chart. You could ask, you know, ask students, use ChatGPT to create some new flow charts on this topic, right? You know, create a new topic for them to do so, right? Or better yet, each an individual topic. Okay. Um, okay. Whew. What do we know? That's a lot of information in a short time. Okay. Like all uh, tools, AI is useful, but it's dangerous if you don't know how to use it, right? Learn. So, or better yet, get your students to learn about AI tools and teach you and each other to help. Um, okay, so that's all that I have right now. I think Thomas is going to maybe share some questions for us, and then he's got a little something else to ask you afterwards.